Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday afternoon to come and listen to me today. My talk is going to be about the cognitive psychology of what you can't see. I'd like to start off by asking you to think about the poster for this event, which shows a young lady with somebody's hands over her eyes. And the implication of that is that if those hands were removed, she would be able to see. And certainly that would be the case. But sometimes the blindfolds are there inside of ourselves, in the way our minds work, in our ideas, in the way we think, in our theories. And what I'm going to talk to you today about are four examples from, I guess, uh, the life of the world, diverse examples of how it is that sometimes the way we think prevents us from seeing what's in front of us, and then I will make some suggestions for how it is that we might help take those blindfolds off, those blindfolds that are in our minds and in our hearts. First example that I want to talk to you about comes from uh, military history, uh, World War II, the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, in wars, which we hope will become fewer and fewer and go to zero, in wars, uh, commanders try to surprise their enemy. They try to attack without the enemy knowing that they're there or that they're going to attack. Now, sometimes you can't disguise your army. Your army's there, and your enemies will see that. So how then can you still have a surprise attack? Well, in the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans convinced the Americans, the British, the French, um, the Canadians, that they weren't going to attack. And one of the ways that they did this was by the name of their operation. And for those of you who haven't heard this before, they called it the Watch on the Rhine. Not the last ditch desperate attack to win the war, they called it the Watch on the Rhine, which implies they were just going to be looking, observing, and waiting. So when their attack came, it was a complete surprise to the Allied commanders. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is an example from the history of science. And up until 1982, if you went to a doctor with a really severe stomach ulcer, the doctor would have told you, well, cut down on the spicy food. The doctor would have told you, try not to feel so much stress. And if you can't control the stress yourself, by all means, go see a psychologist. Well, now, to be sure, um, as a psychologist, I can guarantee you that psychologists can do a lot to help you. But they can't do much if your disease is caused by a bacteria. So, Nobel Prize was won by a couple of Australian physicians who discovered that bacteria does in fact cause these stomach ulcers. But at first, people in the medical, the medical community didn't believe them. They were told, well, no, we don't believe you. We don't believe what you are saying that you see. Now, what it eventually took, among other things, was for uh, Dr. Marshall to chug down the solution of this bacteria, which made him pretty sick, and he developed stomach ulcers and the bacteria was associated with it, that was pretty convincing. But before that, a lot of doctors didn't see this. Why not, you might ask. And one of the reasons was their theory. The stomach is full of acid. It has to be because that's what helps us digest our food. In a stomach full of acid, how is a bacteria going to survive? Well, it turns out what these bacteria do, they're tricky. They hide under a lining that coats the stomach to protect the stomach itself from the acid. But the doctors didn't expect that to be there. Their theory told them no bacteria. So they didn't believe Dr. Marshall and Dr. Warren when they said, look, here it is. Now, um, science, we would like to think, is driven by open-minded people looking at data and changing their theories. Sometimes it's the theory that drives what data you are able to see. So, uh, to paraphrase uh, Max Planck, theories change when the old scientists die off. Right, my next example comes from psychology, it's something called the fundamental attribution error. There's a nice technical definition of it up on your slide right now, but I guess to put that, uh, I guess, in fewer words, the idea is the belief that all you need to judge somebody is just seeing their behavior. Maybe another way of putting that would be, you are what you do. Every uh, time I teach social psychology, I ask my students to write an essay. They share their experiences, making some kind of a judgment about a person, and then later on learning that that judgment just wasn't right. Uh, one young lady agreed to let me share her story with you. Uh, she was working at a part-time job, and her supervisor was another student who wasn't treating her very kindly. 
And so she formed a less than favorable impression of this young man. Later on, though, they got to know each other better in a different set of circumstances, and they became good friends. Now, what had happened on the job, as this young man told uh, the student, was that he was under a lot of pressure from his bosses. They were treating him very, very, very badly, and very, very, very harshly, and he took some of that out on the people that he was in charge of. Now, that wasn't the kind of person that he was, but his circumstances made him act that way. And when my student learned that it was more of his circumstances than his personality that was guiding um, his behavior, she changed her opinion of it. Came to see if he was a much better person. Right now, before I go on to my uh, next example, I guess I'd like to familiarize you with uh, the psychological jargon, the expectation bias. And what this bias refers to is, you see what you expect to see, you don't see something that you're not expecting. Right? Now, I'm going to use this to explain why it is that pilots sometimes make what seems like an obvious, obvious mistake. First of all, I need to explain what a stall is. And in order to do so, I have some origami. The good thing this is not an origami presentation. So. <laughs> anyway, when airplanes fly, they have to keep moving. If they get too slow, they stop flying. If they get too slow, they drop. An airplane always has to keep moving. This is so important that every single pilot, virtually the first thing that he or she learns is how to stall the aircraft and how to recover from the stall. What do you do if your airplane stalls? All right, so here's an airplane, and I hope it's going to fly. Um, I'm going to throw it sideways to make sure it doesn't actually impact anyone, but no guarantees it might bank to one side or the other. <laughs> here it goes. Say no. Flew nicely, didn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm going to change my talk to paper airplane making. Okay, now here's my second paper airplane, and you can probably see I've got the back up a little bit, which simulates what happens in a real airplane. If you want to make the nose go up, one of the things you might do is pull back on your controls, which affects the back part of the airplane, and it will make the airplane do this. And what will happen is it'll slow down, it'll slow down, it'll slow down and then it will stop flying and then drop, if all goes according to plan. So here, let's give that a try. There it goes. Okay. It did that. It went like this, it slowed down, it dropped, and eventually it started flying again because it picked up enough speed to start flying. So now here's what can go wrong as a pilot. Consider the example of American Airlines Flight 903, May 12th, 1997, it's coming in to land, and the pilots are slowing the airplane down a little bit in preparation for landing. They're well over 10,000 feet high. They're told, expect bad weather. Now, when the weather is bad, as those of you I'm sure who have flown know, the plane might start shaking a little bit, it'll start maybe bumping around, you'll be told to fasten your seatbelts. The plane might go up a little bit and go down a little bit unexpectedly. But the pilots were told to expect bad weather, they were expecting this. So sure enough, when the airplane starts to go down, they thought it's bad weather. It turned out it was a stall. They didn't recognize that stall as a stall, and so they didn't do what they needed to do to recover it, even though they were well trained to do so, to recognize it and to take the appropriate action. Now, relax, the story has a happy ending, nobody dies. But the pilots got lucky. They didn't do what they needed to do to recover from the stall. They didn't, in fact, realize that they'd stalled the aircraft until the accident investigators shared that information with them well after the accident. I should say incident, excuse me. So, um, you might think that a pilot that does something like this is a stupid pilot, right? I see some people nodding their heads. Well, if you did that, you yourself might be making the fundamental attribution error. You saying stupid behavior equals stupid person, and there might be something in the circumstances that are really guiding the behavior. That's where the blindfolds come into the situation. The pilots weren't expecting a stall. They were expecting bad weather, so they interpreted the drop as being a result of the bad weather. So 
how can we deal with these problems as human thinkers? What's the cure? Is it to wait for all the old scientists to die off? I'd like to think not. Um, I'm going to suggest to you today four ways that we might, as humans, as thinkers, overcome these problems. First way is to always be humble. Recognize that you can't be wrong. That there are some situations where it's very likely that you will be wrong. This will help you be aware of how it is that you need to be cautious in making your decision and always be looking for other possibilities. This will let you forgive people who do make mistakes, and that will enable you to learn from those mistakes. You can forgive yourself and learn from your own mistakes as well. All right, be playful is my next bit of advice to you. When you learn a new concept, play with it. Try putting it together with other concepts and see what happens. It might be crazy, it might be fantastical, but who knows what will come of that thought. Let's consider my previous example, by the way, of uh, psychologists not being able to cure your bacterial infection. Let's play with that for a moment and imagine that it's possible. Well, by doing that play, who knows, maybe it will never be possible, but when the day comes that it is, we'll recognize it. We won't be blind to that possibility. Third suggestion that I have for you is to be open. Now, as a psychology teacher, I've been studying psychology for years, I've been teaching it for years, and sometimes I think I know it all. <laughs> I say. But when a student comes to me looking at my field with fresh eyes, sometimes they ask me questions that I can't answer, questions I haven't thought of. Sometimes they call my attention to other concepts, to other ideas, and they ask me what is the relation of this concept to psychology. I haven't thought of that before. By being open to that, I learn. I become a better teacher and a better psychologist. And we at APU, I think, have another opportunity to be open, and that's to take advantage of all the people around us who come from different cultural backgrounds. Different cultures have faced different situations. They've solved different problems. Sometimes another culture may have solved a problem that your culture hasn't solved yet. Now, let me give you one example of that, the fundamental attribution error. It turns out that people from Japan, people from Korea, people from China are less likely to make that kind of a mistake. They're a little bit quicker to take the blindfolds off than, than people from the United States are. And as an American, that's something for me to learn from the people in this part of the world. But my last suggestion to you is to be adventurous. If we knew everything, if we had solved all the problems, if you yourself have developed as a person as much as you possibly can, there's nothing left to do, is there? There's no more fun to be had. So relish the prospect that you could be wrong. And when you find out that your precious ideas and your precious theories might not work, savor that as a chance to explore, to have fun, and to have an adventure. So now let me conclude with words of one of our great human adventurers, Professor Stephen Hawking, who has said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. On that note, thank you very much for your kind attention.